told my dad after his Sunday school lesson this morning that I didn't realize he was going to preach my sermon <laughs> at the time when I was preparing for, uh, the topic for today. And so he kind of, <clears throat> he set the table very well, stole a few things uh, that were mine, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I sat under his preaching for 34 years, so it's probably not surprising that we think somewhat alike. But anyways, um, so today, that's what I want to do is kind of build on, those of you who were in Sunday school, we're going to be discussing something very similar, but I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter number 7. I'm going to pose a question to you today that <clears throat> uh, is an important question that we contemplate in the times in which we live. Now the Bible has a lot to say about the kind of things that will be going on in the last days, amen? amen. And you can look around and you could probably see about 137 of those uh, already being fulfilled right in front of our eyes. And a lot of those have to do with the things that will be going on in the world. Some of those have to do with the things that will be going on in Israel. But some of those things have to do with what is taking place in the church. I use that term very broadly and at large. But churches who are supposed to be the pillar and the ground of what? The truth. The reason this is uh, really on my heart today, I guess, and why I felt like Today might be a good opportunity to, to lay aside some time to talk about this one question particularly is because we shouldn't be and we're not surprised at the things we see going on in the world. Amen? Amen. The world is the world. It's always been the world. Uh, me and my wife were talking the other day. It's not like, um, you know, wicked men are wicked. David said, wickedness proceedeth from the wicked. So our times today are very wicked, but they're not necessarily more wicked than they were in Paul's day. Or in the day in which you had uh, you know, Herod's wife asking for John the Baptist's head on a plate. Okay? Pretty wicked. Right? There's, uh, so there's always been wickedness. This is something that's near to my heart, though. What's taking place in churches? Because what's taking place in churches is also foretold as a sign of the end times. And we see it just rapidly, uh, you know, blooming and blossoming and, and really filling the earth with, with this idea of Christianity uh, that's really quite foreign to Christ. And so what happens is that the world, like I said a couple weeks ago, even the world knows things are not going well. Okay, the world knows this is not good. We're not necessarily headed in a positive direction. So they're trying to figure out how to solve that on their own. Of great concern to me is people who desire to escape the world, who have finally seen the world in its hopeless condition, and they begin to think, I need better answers than what the world can give. Where are they likely to turn? Churches. People in the world, I mean, you talk to people all the time, and they, they know instinctively, at a certain point when they kind of bottom out, that they begin to look to churches to provide some answers, some hope, some understanding. Now what happens when churches begin to look like what churches are foretold to be in the end times? That people come to churches looking for light only to find what is sold to them as light to be disappointed in the end and find that it, it wasn't light at all. That in fact, churches who ought to be the pillar and the ground of the truth and ought to be the light of the world are now a place where people from the world can escape only to feel comfortable, to feel uh, a sense of peace. And I'm going to share some pretty uh, distinct things with you this morning. And this has to do with a warning. All through God's word, and especially in the New Testament, we see the warning. Uh, and sometimes it comes in the forms of this. Run! Right? Sometimes it's flee. Flee means to run. So flee these things, right? When you see these things, flee them. Sometimes I think we think spiritual strength is being able to withstand uh, the place of temptation. Spiritual wisdom is to flee the place of temptation and to not, to not even be in a place where that could prevail over your spirit. So when we look at what is happening in churches today, I wanted to start at Matthew 7.15, because all of this was foretold, and we're not going to necessarily go into it at depth from a prophetic view, but I want you to understand today that there is a lot of uh, falseness associated with the name of Christ. Right. 
And we're going to uncover just a few of those things. And I want you to simply be able to answer this question. What does it mean to be Christian? What does it mean to be Christian? Because you may not have noticed, but as is rapidly happening in the world today, so many things are marketed to us as being Christian. And if you don't know what makes something so, or someone so rather, then it's really easy to be swept away with the error of the wicked. You've got to know what makes something even Christian to begin with. Is it the marketing uh, aspect of it? I mean, if it has a cross on the cover, are we to assume that this is Christian? If they use the name Christ or Jesus, are we to just take it on face value that this is Christian? So how can we understand and know the truth? Because you might not realize, but lies are dangerous things. They've been so in my life. I know they've been in your life, and eternity will prove it even more so to be so. Lies are dangerous things. In Matthew 7, 15, if you'll stand with me, as we read just a, a verse or two here, to kind of get our bearings and to begin to lay some foundations, I really want you, by the time we finish, it is probably going to take a morning and an evening. But by the end of this morning, um, I heard somebody say recently, you know, the... Uh, the preaching of God's word and the importance of it and you know how much is too much he said well you preach until people are so bored with God's word that they fall asleep and fall down out of the balcony and, and are taken up dead and you know when people are that tired of hearing the word of God it's still not too much because Paul went down and they brought him back and he went on preaching some more until morning right so but we're not going to necessarily go to that extent but I do want to leave this morning with you to be able to answer what is what defines Christian, and, and, and you might think, well, that's easy. Well, it may not be easy, but I want us to be able to really get it down to one word. What is one word that tells us how, to we, how can we discern? Anybody interested in discernment in the days in which we live? I am. This world is full of nonsense, and we need the power of God and his spirit in us to give us some discernment so that we can understand some things that are happening around us. And this is a little bit of a departure. This morning's service will be a little bit unusual uh, in the sense that typically uh, I want to come into the pulpit and I want to just teach, um, teach you and, and preach God's word. And today, this is more of a kind of take a step back and look at a snapshot of what's happening around us. And the only reason I feel like that as a pastor, that that's part of my responsibility is to watch for the spiritual welfare of the sheep. Amen. And so I take that responsibility this morning in hand, and, and we're going to take a service today to talk about some things that are happening around us uh, that we need to be aware of. You'll find often in the apostles' teachings and writings that they did the same. They wrote to the churches to warn them about error that was creeping into the churches. So let's talk about that a little bit this morning and start in Matthew chapter number 7. Verse number 15. I'll get on the right page with you in just a minute. The Lord Jesus Christ here speaking, and part of his doctrine. Now, you might remember, as we said on uh, Wednesday, I believe it was, that the reason the apostles' doctrine was what it was, and the reason they taught about false prophets and false teachers and all those things, is why? Because the Lord had commanded them to teach everything they had been taught. And what we find among the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ is this, beware of false prophets. Now, you'll notice if you read the two verses immediately prior, this is in the context of discerning between the broad way and the narrow way. Right. He said there's a broad way that leads to destruction, and there's many people that go in thereat, but there's a narrow way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. In the context of that, he says, beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Then he teaches them, ye shall know them by their fruits. I, and we mentioned this a little bit on Wednesday. 
The seed that is received into the heart, I mean, it's just the picture of agriculture. If you sow an apple seed, what kind of tree will grow? An apple tree. And in time, when you get fruit off the apple tree, what's inside? An apple seed. The exact thing that was sown into the ground produces a plant that then produces fruit that contains the very essence of what was planted in the ground. This spiritual principle is the same, which is why we said that when we see teachers taking the doctrines of Christ and applying them exclusively to the things that appeal to the desires of fallen flesh, right? Money, prosperity, health, all the things, the carnal things of this life. When that's the thrust of their teaching and their message, what are they showing? They're manifesting the hidden counsels of their own heart. They're saying, these are the things that I value, that I treasure. This is the fruit, right, of their teaching. And it contains the seed. So what are they sowing into your life? They're teaching you to desire the same things that they desire, to value the same things they value, to treasure the same things they treasure, to seek the same things they seek. And what are many of them seeking? Your money. <laughs> they want your money in their pocket, right? And so without going... We could go I could ad nauseum, right? We could have a week-long conference about all the prosperity gospel stuff that's going around, not only in this country, but around the world. Why? Because there's about 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet that those things appeal to. I mean, if you're trying to market something to people and you say, hey, there's a gospel that will make you wealthy and prosperous and healthy, who doesn't want those things? Can you find me... Some people that don't want those things. I mean, everybody wants them. So it's very appealing to the masses. However, it contains no life. Jesus Christ said his words are spirit. And by the way, not, uh, he said also his words are spirit and they are life. He said the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Which tells us there are words that are spirit that are not life. He qualifies his words by two witnesses, their spirit and their life. So he's here telling them to beware and to examine some fruit. He says, because it's not possible that a good tree to bring forth evil fruit, in verse number 18, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth what? Good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, wherefore by their fruits ye shall know. God wants you to know. It's so what we said last week. He wants you to know. Everything in his word is given to men so they can know the truth. That's what God wants you to know. He doesn't want you to be at peace with yourself. He doesn't want you to forgive yourself. He doesn't want to make you comfortable right where you are. None of those things are true. He wants you to know the truth about yourself, about sin, about righteousness, about judgment to come. I want you to know the truth of those things. Amen? And he's given us his word so that we can know them. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you this morning just thankful for your word and this opportunity you've given us this morning. Just a brief opportunity to present your word, to discuss it, and to declare it, Lord. We pray that you might bless the services today, that the things learned here and said here would be pleasing and honoring to you. Father, we just pray that you might guide our services, that you might guide my mouth, guide our hearts as we look to you this morning for instruction, for wisdom in the times in which we live, that you might continue to grant us wisdom and discernment, Lord, by the power of your Spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We know that in the last days, God has said he's going to pour out a delusion, right, on mankind. We also know that he says that judgment begins where? the house of God. So when we, when we start looking at some of the things I want to share with you this morning, I want you to take it in the light, in the context of what we looked at um, in Luke eleven thirty five earlier this year, when the Lord Jesus Christ warning says, take heed that the light which is in thee be not darkness. So it's this whole idea of, is, is there something that looks to be light, but is actually darkness? And the answer is yes. The devil himself transforms himself into an angel of light. What does that mean? It means he, he pretends to be a messenger 
or one who brings enlightenment and understanding and that he's offering these opportunities to men right and he's teaching them truth right but it's not so how can we discern it's it's got to be understood how can we discern so building on that idea i want you to turn to jeremiah 13 just for some uh some context here before we dive right in i got a few slides i want to show you this morning how many of, i know you guys like it when i bring slides as i told connor i had a slide deck for the sermon this morning and he's like yes right it's a little visual aid and it's helpful right visual aids are helpful um help something to kind of grab your attention and maybe cement these ideas jeremiah 13 verse number 12 the lord telling jeremiah therefore thou shalt speak unto them this word thus saith the lord god of israel every bottle shall be filled with wine so that's what the Lord tells Jeremiah. I want you to go tell these people uh, this word. Every bottle shall be filled with wine. And that was what he was supposed to say to them. Then the Lord tells him what the people's response is going to be. And they shall say unto thee, Do we not certainly know that every bottle shall be filled with wine? I mean, So Jeremiah is sent with his message to say, I have a word from the Lord. Every bottle is to be filled with wine. Then the people that receive the message are going to sit there and hear that, and they're going to say, well, isn't that why we make bottles? Don't we already know that the reason to have a bottle is to fill it? So the people would not understand the message. Why? Because they're carnal in their thinking. And Jeremiah's word to them is spiritual. So they hear the spiritual word about how every vessel is going to be filled with wine and they understand it only in the sense of the natural and they say okay that's kind of the purpose of bottles is to fill them with wine we get it you're not telling us anything we don't know jeremiah right it's kind of their attitude then the lord says thou shalt say unto them thus saith the lord behold i will fill all the inhabitants of this land so what's god doing he's now teaching them the meaning of the word that he sent he's saying yeah you make bottles and you put wine in them let me tell you what i'm gonna do with the vessels i've made and notice what he's gonna do i will fill all the inhabitants of this land even the kings that sit upon david's throne and the priests and the prophets and all the inhabitants of jerusalem with drunkenness what kind of drunkenness spiritual drunkenness then he goes on to say and i will dash them one against another even the fathers and the sons together saith the lord i will not pity nor spare nor have mercy but destroy them now you could make a lot of application about what's happening in this text but what i want you to see is that god tells his people his people by whom his name was called upon them and he says, because of your rebellion and your sin and your rejection of my counsel, and because of your transgression against the covenant that we have made, I'm going to fill you with drunkenness. And because of that drunkenness, you're going to go on to destroy yourselves. And the Lord's going to oversee it and preside over that. Because he's declared that's what's going to happen. Well, I think that's pretty accurate picture of what's happening in the world today as far as Christianity is concerned. That people who claim to know the Lord Jesus Christ and who wear his name upon them have so rejected his counsel and his word and his covenant that he says, you want the things of this world? I'll fill you with them. I'll fill you with it. I'll fill you with it till you're drunk and vomiting and until you are destroyed. Is God righteous? God is righteous. When his people say, I want this world's stuff. What did Jesus Christ teach? He said, beware, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting 
and with drunkenness and with the cares of this life. Why? Because the day of Christ is coming upon that generation completely unaware. And there's a very clear reason for that. But this spirit of drunkenness is, is from God, but it's not his Holy Spirit. You hear people say, talk about being drunk in the Spirit? Oh, it's a spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit. So God is very clear, um, and we need to be very humble. So what I, what I share with you today is not so that we can go out and we can dash one against the other. Right? That's not the purpose and intent. The purpose and intent is so that this church, with its members can seek the Lord God in humility and in truth and pray and ask for him to forgive us and to turn us and to guide us in the way of truth. It has nothing to do with what's happening everywhere else in the world. It's not so we can sit here and say, oh, I can't believe you can believe they're doing that. And it, what is all the apostles in the New Testament? They said, take heed to the things that we have. Don't let them slip away, right? You got to earnestly contend for these things, lest they slip and get away from us. So, with that in mind, I want to share just a few things. When we talk about the idea of what is Christian, when I say what is, it really ought to be who is. But we live in a culture where things are Christian rather than we're not really talking about people anymore. We're talking about movements, we're talking about uh, groups, we're talking about whatever, right? Music, we're talking about worship, we're talking about praise, we're talking about all kinds of things. So when we think about Christian in our culture, it's often what is Christian because we're thinking about the things. The truth is, a what can't be Christian at all, right? Christians have to be people. So it's not really a what. So I put it up there that way on purpose to remind me to make the point. So when we say what is Christian, we're really saying who is Christian, right? So this is, a, this is a personal thing. So when we talk, especially when we get into music, it's a very interesting conversation, but it's an important one to have because God has a purpose for music. Do you believe that? Amen. Satan has a purpose for music. Do you believe that? Okay, so both have a purpose for music, and they're both quite different. So in your music, do you understand the difference, right? In our life, do we understand the difference? I'm going to share a few statistics with you here. This is from a Pew Research poll, and I only share this because I'm going somewhere. This, this is so you can have some context, and by the time we get where we're going, some of you look bored already. That's not my problem. Do you understand me? You came to church, and we're here to talk about the things of God. If you're bored, it's not my problem. It's your problem. So I'm going to go on, okay? So let's talk real quickly. When we talk about people in these surveys, this is of all, I think there were around 5,000 respondents who responded to the survey. So we're talking about a group, we narrow down the survey to those who self-identify as Christian. Okay, so these are people who say they're Christian. Do you understand me? Of, of that group, 80% of self-identified Christians say they were willing to affirm that they believe in the God of the Bible. Eighty percent. We just lost a big chunk of our group. So people who self-profess Christianity, eighty percent of them believe in the God of the Bible. The other twenty percent, I don't know if I put it on here, the other 20% do not believe in the biblical description of God. There is a huge part of our problem. Because if, if we don't believe what he said about himself, then we don't believe in God at all. So they don't believe in the biblical description of God, but they do believe in a higher power of some kind. Let me tell you something very important for you to understand. As a man or a woman, there are lots of powers higher than you. Do you understand that? Lots of them. 
Be careful with that stuff. If we don't know what the Bible says about God, then we could be worshiping anything. And it very well could be a higher power. But there's lots of those from where we stand as men and where God is as most high. So there's some diligence required. 78% of self-professing Christians believe that God is omnipotent. 78%. I believe that means he has all power. So he has the power to do anything. 78% believe that. 87% believe that he knows everything. Forty percent believe in psychics. You didn't see that one coming, did you? Forty percent of self-professing Christians believe in psychics. Now, I'm not saying this statistic holds true across the body. I'm saying of the 5,000 people that were surveyed, these were the results. It's Forty percent. Twenty-nine percent of self-professing Christians believe in reincarnation. That's astounding. That's three out of ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So from Thaddeus to Jim, three of you. Which three? <laughs> I want to meet you in my office after the service this morning. <laughs> and clear your afternoon. <laughs> I have no idea how to pronounce that first word. Is that a legionnaire? I like that. That sounds very French. Legionnaire Ministries. This was their poll. 32%, this is of evangelicals, right? So people that self-identify as evangelical. 32% agree that Jesus was a great teacher, but that he was not God. Problematic. 46% agree God accepts the worship of all religions. That's almost half. Let me put it to you another way. A small minority, a small minority of, of people that profess Christ don't believe that God accepts worship from every religion. Just a small majority. Did I say minority? Small majority. 56% agree. So this is a majority of Christians believe that Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. If he was created, he can't be God. Do you understand? He can't be God and be created. That's, that's a majority. A majority of people who say they're Christian believe that. 51% agree, which is a small majority, that the Holy Spirit is a force, but that he's not a personal being. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is God. Not just some force. 54% disagree that even the smallest sin deserves eternal damnation. Who just says what's small? Because it's not defined in God's word anywhere. Also problematic. We could go on at some length with these kind of statistics. Every survey, no matter what the source, tends to show pretty much the same results. And the results tell me that there is a great problem among people who think they're Christian when they don't know what that means. They don't know what it means. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that, uh, among which we could probably enumerate that it's a failure of churches to teach proper and sound doctrine. Right? Hearing great stories and illustrations won't keep you away from these errors. It won't. I could tell you stories till the cows come home, and you could feel like you really learned something about how to go live your life, but it won't guard you against this error. So illustrations and stories are not helpful to us when it comes to these kind of problems, right? But other than just failures of churches, I'm guessing most of these people 
don't even go to church. So I don't think we can blame churches across the board for this kind of a problem. So where does the, where does the fault lie? Well, certainly a failure of parents, a failure of parents to study to show themselves approved and to instruct and train their children. The kind of problems that are arising in Christian homes, I want you to hear me, hear me very well. The kind of problems today that are arising in Christian homes cannot arise in that home unless the things of Christ are commingled with all the thinking of the world through movies, entertainment, and education. It's impossible for a child reared in a home that provides the nurture and admonition of the Lord to make some of the choices our young people are making. And I don't want to go into detail in, the, in this general assembly, but you know what I'm saying. It's impossible for those decisions to be made unless there is a very great influence of the world's thinking and principles and ideas. Yeah. can't happen and I'll stand by that so this idea about sin is very important that we understand whose opinion of sin matters like we said last week eating the fruit that was forbidden them would probably not be judged as a death penalty if we were the judge but God said it was and guess who's right God's right and certainly it was. Adam's not here to tell us about it because he died. So there you go. So I want you to think about this idea of Christian this morning. If you turn to Acts chapter number 11, most of you will know this account in Scripture that tells us where this term even came from. Why do we even have the word in our vocabulary, right? Well, there's a reason, and it's found in Acts chapter number 11. Verse number 26, And when he had found him, that is, uh, Barnabas found Saul, when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were, first called, Christ, or were called Christians first in Antioch. Now, there's two words in that verse, and I'm not going to tell you right now what they are. There's two words in that verse that are absolutely required information for you to have any idea what this term is even talking about. But the name Christian was first used in Antioch at this church, and then it went on to fill the world until we have just a couple more mentions of it in Acts 26 when Paul is before Agrippa. Agrippa makes this statement which is much later, probably some 20 years or so more has passed, uh, and that's rough math shooting from the hip. I didn't research that. But a lot of time has passed since this first mention of Christians. And then Agrippa makes this statement when Paul's preaching to him, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And then Peter's use of it, if any man suffer as a Christian. So we have just a few mentions of the, the name in Scripture. And, and some of the things I'm going to go on to share with you will make you uncomfortable. And um, some of you may not like it. I don't know what your reaction will be. But I'm, I'm sharing it with you out of a desire for you to know the truth. Amen. Okay, so it's, it's interesting to me to get different reactions around this. Um, but the Scripture is very clear, and that has to be where we go. Think what we're going to think. So let's see if this will work. I'm going to share this with you. And I, I thought about and prayed about whether or not I should even do this because this is, I don't take this lightly, but I'd seen this and I want you to see it. So if it's going to bother you, now's a good time to catch up on your potty breaks. <laughs> but this is what passes for church today. Okay? And we'll see if this will play. It's about a minute. Oh, can I get some sound? This is a little more than a minute, and it's going to be tough to watch. So you're just going to have to bear with me. 
I think it's important. You got sound? Okay, let me back up and start from the beginning. Come on, Evan Mason, I want to know, are you with us tonight? Okay, that's it about, about, that was about a 7 out of 10. Innovation Youth, are you with us tonight? Here's what I need you to know, okay? Tonight it's not about watching us, okay? This isn't a performance. Tonight we want you to praise Jesus with everything that you have, okay? Maybe you're standing on your head. Is it okay for me to hit the nene today? Yes. Is it okay for me to do the shoot today? Yes. Is it okay for me to go crazy today? I want to know, do we have some dancers in the house? Do we have some people who can bounce in the house? Hey, let's see if you guys can dance to this one. Let's go, Josh. That's heartbreaking. Yeah. And by the way, if that's the special you want to sing next Sunday, no. <laughs> If it just says, jump, 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 hey, hey, jump, no. Not in this church. Amen. So, you've seen it. What's wrong with it? So, do you believe that that was all about Jesus. They do. They do. That's sad. So this is what I mean when I go to Jeremiah and I read about the spirit of drunkenness being poured out. And this is what I mean when I say when the world starts figuring out they need answers and they flee to the church, what are they going to find? What's going to be waiting for them? It's all about Jesus, okay? All about Jesus, right? Let me ask you something this morning. The things you know about Jesus, how do you know them? See, if I wrote a song about Allison's grandmother, and I said, hey, I want to share with you all this great song I wrote about Allison's grandma. It's all about how loving she is, and she's wonderful. I wrote a song for her, and I sang it to all of you. You'd think, wow. That was for Allison's grandma. That's wonderful. But if somebody that actually knew Allison's grandma was in the room, and I said, hey, I'm going to sing this song about Allison's grandma, about halfway through the song, they might say, that doesn't sound anything like my grandma. <laughs> yeah. Who are you singing about? This is what's happened today. The name is the only thing that's the same. If I get up like that young man just did and I say, hey, this is all about Jesus, and then I proceed to do whatever, 
because I've prefaced it in his name, what is that designed? Don't, don't think in the physical terms and don't think about that young man. In a spiritual sense, what is that designed to do? It can only have one purpose. It is to disarm believers. It's to make you think this is a place where I can lay my armor aside for a while. I can take my spiritual armor off because this is about Jesus now. Right? It's, its whole motive and intent is to deceive. I'm saying those people are deceived. And deceived people are deceivers. Have you ever been deceived in your life and continued to deceive other people because you thought it was true? Deceived people become deceivers. It's just how it works. So when we say something's all about Jesus, we need to know what we're talking about. That is not about Jesus because they don't know Jesus. Okay, so how can we discern? Because you can't just, if you have a young person who wants to go to youth group, at the church down the street. That's what that was. Okay, that's a youth group at a church. And it's all about Jesus, by the way. So you can't criticize it. Because it's all about Jesus. So, let's go from here with that in mind. I want you to look at Matthew 24. And I'm going to share one more thing that, uh, you know, that might snag some youth. Grab a... That might snag some youth, but what about adults, right? Is the adults in this room, are you going to fall for that? You're like, no, my knees are killing me. I don't... <laughs> right? The kind of things that excite young people are different than the kind of things that excite old people, right? If that was for old people, it would be like a huge banquet hall full of Lazy Boy recliners, and, <laughs> right? But what do kids want to do? They want to do something fun. They want to do something exciting. They feel good. They're in their prime. They want to jump around. They want to shout, right? So it's all designed for young people. Now, old people, it's, it's different. So I want you to look at Matthew chapter number 24, verse number 5. And I want to share with you something that is happening all around us, and you may not even be aware of it. In verse number 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man, what? Deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. This deception in the name of Christ is a fascinating study all by itself. But you might not be surprised to know that if you go into uh, listening to some of the music that is being sold under these banners, which is really spiritual names like Bethel Music, you know, House of God, you can't argue with that. Um, you know, Hillsong is a big one. Probably everybody in here has heard about uh, Hillsong. You know, so they, they write all this music. And what's interesting is some of them even, it sounds like that they are waiting for the Antichrist himself to show up on the earth. And it's weird. It's kind of creepy. Um, but anyways, when we talk about this deception in Christ's name, this is Jesus Christ himself saying that he is warning in advance that there's going to be a lot of deception and that there's going to be many come in his name and say, I am what? Not I am Jesus, although there's been a few lunatics that have said that over the years as well. Um, but they say, I am Christ. Now, what you may not know is that there are already millions and millions of people who believe from the scriptures in their own twisted way in what they call the Christ principle. And they use the Bible, and they use his name, Christ, and then they talk about Jesus, how he was basically... Um, a man who had fully realized the Christ within and that you can do the same thing. Now let me read to you some of this smooth talk 
because I want, I want you to think about the kind of, I mean, you see this stuff popping up on, on Facebook and everywhere, and you see some Christians that sharing things on Facebook because it sounds Christian-y. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. Don't share Christian-y sounding things on Facebook because it sounds Christian-y. Let me walk you through some of the stuff. Because uh, what I've seen is you share something from a site because it sounds Christian-y. And what are you basically doing? You're endorsing the site. Pointing people back. Oh, I wonder where they found that. I'll go find some more. Let me show you some of this. So from a, there, there's a devotional that goes out. It's a global devotional. Um, and it is called the Daily Word. I don't know if you've heard of it, um, but it's called Daily Word. Let me read to you just a couple of devotional excerpts from the Daily Word. I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, they say. They go on to explain, Christ lives in me. Christ is that presence in me, which animates my mind and body. Christ in me is my power to move and my ability to accomplish. Christ in me blesses my every heartbeat. Christ in me regulates, adjusts, and sustains every function of my body. The healing, harmonizing Christ is the only activity in every cell of my being. As I keep knowing this, I experience what I know. I let Christ within me think through my mind, see through my eyes, speak through my voice, work through my hands, radiate through my body. I constantly remind myself that I am on this earth for the purpose of letting the deathless, ageless, joyous Christ manifest himself throughout my being now. To which you're supposed to feel very inspired and connected and at peace and all the rest. Now, is that a, is that a true exposition of the verse, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me? So you read over that and you think, boy, that's smooth, isn't it? That is smooth. Let me read another one and see if this helps. Christ's principle from the daily word. Christ liveth in me. Peter recognized in Jesus that inner principle called Christ. Is that what Peter did? The son of God. In truth, man is Christ. Jesus so perceived his spiritual manhood that he became the Christ. The great father principle ruled his consciousness absolutely. The disciples recognized in Jesus the expression of infinite principle, infinite in its authority and power. They saw Jesus still the waves and dispel disease through his consciousness of principle. So in their view, God is a principle and the Son of God, this Christ consciousness is in all of us and it's a principle as well. And the more we realize it, then we become like Christ or like the Son of God. You say, well, that all just sounds a little strange and weird. Here's a, one of their excerpts from one of their earlier devotionals. It says, God made man in his own image and likeness. Do you agree with that? Then they go on to say, since God is perfect, man in his true estate must also be perfect. By our thoughts and our words, we can identify ourselves with the perfection of this true self, or we can identify ourselves with mortal limitations. As he thinketh in it within himself, so is he. So again, using scripture to try to correlate their ideas and to sell it in a devotional called the Daily Word. And by the way, they call this Christianity. Let me read to you just a headline and a sentence from a number of their um, devotionals here. Inner peace. With God is my peace, I rest deeply and breathe easily. Guidance. I am guided by infinite wisdom in all matters. Life. I am one and now fully flourish in divine life. One with and now fully flourish in divine life. Strength. Through wind and storm, I stand steady knowing God is my strength. Harmony. I'm willing to be a presence of divine love in all my relationships. Inner peace. My mind quiets in the presence of divine peace. Wisdom. In the silence of prayer, I hear a whisper of truth. Vitality. God is the breath of life, the vitality in my body and being. Prosperity. I am rich in divine ideas, wealthy in divine abundance. Faith. The road ahead may be unseen, but I walk by faith and not by sight. Here's an interesting one that I found very interesting, very troubling, really. So they have this title of an article called Strength, Service, and the Power of the Word. Right? But then you read the article, and it's about the power of their devotional. 
But do you, what I want you to notice from this is the terminology. What is happening is that all of the terminology is being harmonized and amalgamated together. Why? Because they have to appeal to everyone. What I'm telling you is if I just read through these things, do any of, I mean, do they sound good? Man, they're close, aren't they? It's good. And you say, wow, that sounds good. But is it good? Is it good? It brings us back to the question, what makes someone a Christian? Because these people profess to be Christians too. But their doctrine will send people to hell. It'll send people to hell. If you believe their doctrine, you will go to hell. You need to understand that. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, 4, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached. So is it possible to preach Jesus that is not Jesus? Paul says yes. It's absolutely not only possible. He says it to the church in Corinth that it's going to happen. People are going to come to you preaching. And just because they invoke the name Jesus, does that make it Christian? Well, there's something obviously missing in that idea. And yet, how many times do we simply accept on, on the face because it's Christian? Right? I mean, we accept it on the face because it's Christian. So what I want you to think about this idea this morning, and I know I'm a little long here um, by your standards, that I, I want to bring you to a place before we dismiss this morning, uh, because mostly this has been sharing statistics and information, so I haven't really started preaching yet. But nonetheless, I want you to know some things about Jesus that you have to know to even know what a Christian is. So is it possible to know what a Christian is without knowing who Christ is? The answer is no. You can't possibly know what a Christian is if you don't know who Christ is. So Christian means to follow after Christ, to be like Christ. So it follows then that we must first go back to Christ and we must identify and understand who Christ is before we can make any headway understanding whether or not some, someone or in our culture something is Christian. So who is Christian must then equal who is Christ. To understand one is to understand the other. They're the, they're the same thing. So when we talk about Christ, Christ is not a principle, obviously. Uh, he is a person. Amen. Jesus is the Christ. There was only ever one Christ, and you're not him, and I'm not him, and it's not a her, and it's not a force, and it's not a principle. Right. Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one. Kind of limits it, doesn't it? So while we may find this idea of the Christ principle, and I say we in the broad sense of humanity, may find some appeal and we might be able to pull some bits and pieces of verses out to make it fit the idea. The truth is that there's only one Christ and Jesus is the Christ. That's it. So you've got to know your scriptures to know that because all these other people use scripture as well. And as I would like you to keep in mind, beware of Bible words that are devoid of Bible sentences. Good rule of thumb in the world in which we live today. Beware of Bible words that are devoid of Bible sentences. You've got to understand the context and you've got to know what the Bible is teaching. Not just pull out a word about love and a word about Jesus and a word about forgiveness. Okay, lots of Bible words get used all the time in things that are completely removed from Christ. So Christian is not just knowing the right vocabulary and terms 
However, we see through those that self-identify as Christian that there is a great lack of understanding. So if that's the state of Christianity at large in our country, what are the chances that that same group of people will be able to discern the truth about these doctrines? I would say probably not very likely. So Jesus is the Christ, first of all. Only one, and there will only ever be one. And he's him, right? So we got to settle that. You're not going to become the Christ, and Christ in you doesn't mean uh, that you are just like and can be just like Jesus. He is unique. He's the only begotten Son of God right? And he's, he's from everlasting to everlasting. You're never going to be divine as he is divine. He is the only one, right? So be wary of things that sound Christian-ish, uh, like some of the things I just read you, but completely devoid of any truth, and I'll explain that statement in a minute. So when we talk about Jesus is the Christ, that's the first piece to know. Jesus the Christ. He's the only one. There's not other ones. Who is Jesus then? Great question. Most of our respondents don't seem to know the answer. We spend a lot of time trying to teach who is Jesus. But most simply, for our purposes today, looking at Scripture, he is the Word. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. Right? And the Word was with God, and the Word was was God. He was not created. He was not made. He was God. So in the beginning was God. The Word was God. And you know it down to verse number 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. When the Lord asked uh, his disciples, whom do men say that I am? It was absolutely necessary and essential for them, for their faith and for their salvation, to properly identify who Jesus was. A failure to understand who Jesus is, is a failure that can lead you right into the gates of hell. He asked his disciples, and Peter said, thou art the Christ. So Jesus is the word. Jesus is the Christ. He's the word. And the word is what? The truth. Now that seems like simple math. Right? Just three little pieces of information to remember. But these are scriptural foundations. So what I'm telling you is that when we go to God's word and we read Jesus, we can, on God's authority, substitute the word where his name appears and it be accurate. You follow me? Jesus is the word made flesh. It's one and the same. And so John goes uh, at great length to tell us that in both his gospel and in his epistles. We understand that truth. We have to know it, believe it, understand it, apply it, right? So the word is the truth. Now, can you be saved by believing in Jesus? Only if you know who he is. Listen. Listen. You can go straight through the gates of hell claiming the name of Jesus. You can, and many will, because they never knew him. Okay? So a lot of people out there, what I, the reason I want you to know and understand this, because a lot of people out there are telling the world, accept Jesus into your heart and you'll be saved, and that's a lie. First of all, the name of Jesus Christ is, does not represent across the world the proper scriptural view of Jesus Christ. Even among Christians, they don't know who he is. So if I tell you, accept Jesus Christ into your heart, first of all, that's doctrinally problematic. Second of all, which Jesus? Which Jesus? The Jesus that we saw in our video? Because they're all praising Jesus too. It's all about Jesus, remember? It's not about us. It's not a performance. It's all about Jesus. Well, Jesus is the Word. And one thing that was notably lacking in that entire experience 
was an elevation of the word. It's actually quite absent and remarkably so. And we didn't get there overnight. This has happened by degrees. But now we can actually have church and praise Jesus and never mention anything of his word, which is a doctrinal impossibility. That's not praising Jesus because Jesus is the word. And any, any music or praise or worship that's going to exalt and lift up Jesus must exalt and lift up and extol his word. Has to. Okay? Has to, because they're one and the same. They're one and the same. So when we ask, how is the word known? Right? Jesus Christ is the word. Salvation is a promise to those who receive his testimony on faith. How is that word known? It has to be taught and preached. It has to be taught and preached. If you're looking for the best church in your area, it's not the church that has the best programs, the most activities, the best music, the best musicians. The best church has the best teaching, the best preaching the best doctrine that's the best church you can find your salvation depends on it the eternal difference between heaven and hell depends on it you can send your kids to youth group if they never get any teaching or preaching they're lost they have there's nothing for them to put faith in we wonder why we bring the that group together as a church and the leadership of that church says hey this is church and this is about Jesus we wonder why their faith falls flat we wonder why they go out into the world and say well the world's got a better version of that the world has a better version of that you're not going to compete on his territory but the church is trying to this is the truth of the matter everything that pretends to be Christian is measured by doctrine. Everything. It cannot be Christian if it does not agree with the doctrine. Why do I say the doctrine? Well, for a whole lot of reasons. Some of which we'll look at in a, at some point. <laughs> you guys are like, I'm hungry, my stomach's growling, I'm trying to hang in there with you. I appreciate your kindness. Y'all are very nice. But this is important stuff. Okay, there's a lot of stuff pretending to be Christian, but there's no doctrine. Or they teach from the scriptures strange doctrine. Yes. See, it's not just using the Bible to teach. It's teaching what the Bible teaches. What does the word of God teach? It all comes back to doctrine. If someone professes to be a Christian, they must be so based on the doctrine. If some music portends to be Christian, it must be so by the doctrine. Everything is measured by the doctrine. You cannot be in Christ and have his spirit and on your way to heaven with the wrong doctrine. You can't. You cannot I'm saying it because I'm getting some weird blank stares. I want you to understand from God's word. You will not stand in the presence of Christ and be justified by just believing anything you want about his son. You won't be. It's an impossibility. Because one, your life is completely devoid of faith. You've rejected the truth of his doctrine to choose your own. That's not faith. So even on the law of faith, you're condemned because you never put your faith in his word. It, see, it all is going to come back to doctrine. And I want to enumerate this for you uh, in a number of very important ways. But time is going to fail us this morning. The opportunity. I may have, uh, I thought I had a morning and an evening. There might be a little more here than that. <laughs> but let me go. Let me just go lastly this morning to, uh, to where I want to finish up. I want you to turn to Revelation chapter number 3. I know when Gary starts giving up on me, it's time to quit. 
Revelation chapter number 3, and we'll pick up here tonight. We're not going to make it as far as I wanted. And I want to say, first of all, I want to purposefully be slow. I'm purposefully talking slowly, trying to, purposefully delivering, giving time to think, because this is important, critically important stuff. So when we get to Revelation chapter number 3, we're all familiar with the church of Laodicea, are we not? I want you to notice verse number 20 and apply other, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity for us to continue to uh, look at scripture tonight more deeply and thoroughly, but let's just come here understanding what we know about what we just saw that's happening at a church and it's all about Jesus in their words. And let's look at a church that Jesus Christ identifies that is uh, very much a concern if you believe anything about eternal judgment and eternal fire. The Lord says in verse number 20, Behold, next word, I. Somebody tell me who that I is. It's Jesus the Christ. So Jesus the Christ is standing there, and there's a church, right? There's a congregation, an assembly, And they're gathered together, and he's saying, I stand at the door and knock. Now, he's talking to a church here, and he's pleading with them to do what? Open the door. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, Let's take that verse and apply what we know about who Jesus is. Behold, I, the word of God, stand at the door and knock. His name is called the word of God. We see that several times in the book of Revelation. John mentions it a number of times. And what we have is a church, and the word is completely absent. It's on the outside, knocking to gain entrance, to come in. So whatever's happening in that congregation has nothing to do with Jesus. Because he's not in it. He's on the outside, knocking. And if you put the word of God there, And you say, behold, I, Jesus, the Christ, the word of God, I stand at the door and knock. That is exactly what we are seeing in the world today. All kinds of things that are happening in his name, but one thing is glaringly absent and missing. There's no doctrine. There's no doctrine. Jesus is a savior of your own liking. Fashion him and create him to be however you would like him to be. We've turned him into a general principle of grace. Right? A general object of worship. A general means of salvation. But he's none of those things. He's He's not a general principle of grace. He says, I, Jesus the Christ, I'm the door. That's not very general. He's not a general object of worship. He says, I, Jesus the Christ, the word of God. That's who we are worshiping. The Lord says in the Old Testament that he has magnified his word above all his name. And that's spoken in the context of worship all this garbage that passes for worship is garbage it's not worship why because there's one thing glaringly absent glaringly absent what I'd like to talk to you so much more about this I can tell you're excited on the edge of your seat there's a lot for scripture from scripture for us to learn and apply and to understand regarding this but I want you to understand just from this morning as we dismiss you are only a Christian 
Let's go back to our let's go back to our first mention there in the book of Acts, chapter number eleven. Now, there's a, there's a lot of ways that we can expound on this, but just in this one verse, we see in verse number uh, 26, it says, And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and did what? Taught. What happens at church? Teaching. It's got to be teaching. The most important thing that happens here is when we open the word of God and there's teaching taking place. It's the absolute most important thing that takes place in your life or on this earth and certainly in this place. Teaching. They taught much people and the next word, disciples. What were they disciples of? A general principle of grace? Were they a disciple of a general object of worship? No, they were disciples of Christ by virtue of the teaching. We'll go on to see how important this is tonight and maybe some past tonight. Because there's a few things I'm not going to get to probably even tonight that are really, really important for you in your own life to, to apply, to learn, to understand, and to use in evangelism. We can have a better, be better equipped to teach people. I was talking to a guy the other day, uh, and he, he said to me, he said, he said, well, so what's the deal with, with salvation? Because I've heard that it's something like you just have to ask Jesus in your heart. He said, is that true? And I told him, I said, that's not true. And he laughed. He said, I knew it couldn't be that easy. <laughs> I said, don't get me wrong. It is not hard. Salvation is already paid for. But for you to have access to the grace that was paid for, you have to have faith. And you cannot have faith without some doctrine. You can't. Hear me well. You can't have faith without doctrine. Because the doctrine is the means by which that teaching is imparted the word of God that you are believing. And so it was a good conversation, but I feel kind of bad afterwards because he's going to hear half of what I said and go tell somebody, yeah, I was talking to a Baptist preacher and he said, asking Jesus into your heart is not how you get saved. Well, it's not. But it's sometimes confusing to people who have heard a lot of different things. But you have to start with the basics. Who was Jesus? What did Jesus ask his own disciples? Who am I? Man, you've got to know that. You've got to know it. And then you have to believe it. And then you can begin to understand the doctrine. So, we have a church of the end times. We were told this would come because there's coming times when they will not endure sound doctrine. They won't endure it. What do they want? Games. You know, movie night. Um... <laughs> you name it. Concerts, entertainment, anything but dry, old-fashioned teaching from God's Word, right? Who has an appetite for that? Well, not the natural man. Not the natural man. I don't want any of that. No, give me the rock music. Give me the glow sticks. I can have a lot of fun with glow Do we have, I mean, that should be on our church questionnaire. Do you have glow sticks? <laughs> So really, I'm not interested in attending if there's no glow sticks involved. I say that a little tongue-in-cheek. It's really sad what's become of the church, which is to be a pillar in the ground of the truth. Hold it, hold it way up. That's what we're here to do. Okay, I'm the only one that's going to do it? Okay, there we go, a couple. That's what we're here to do. If you want to know who Jesus is, where are you going to find out? It's right here. It's nowhere else. You're not going to find out at that church. And how are you going to know him? Through his word, 
And it's all about the doctrine. So that was a little long this morning. Let's just count that mostly introductory to what I'm trying to go, where I'm trying to go with this. The reason this is a burden on my heart is because it is exploding. It is exploding. And I'm concerned for our young people. I'm concerned for some of our old people. You've got to be grounded. You've got to know the doctrine, right? So that you can have your senses exercised to discern good and evil, right? You've got to know the doctrine. So we'll talk a little bit more tonight about some of that, and uh, I hope that it will be useful to you. But just know for this morning, I'm going to say it one last time, and you're like, I think you've made that point. That's fine, because you have to know this going forward. Anything that purports to be Christian will be so based on the doctrine. It has everything to do with it, all right? With that, we'll have a